Hello and welcome to Horror Called Trash It Over, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash to pieces of genre cinema. My name's Chris. I'm Gary. And this week we are back again with another, our second, Japanuary episode for 2023. Um, this week was my choice and uh, I decided to choose one of my favourite films of all time and it's... Sequel. The other one. The, the new the, one. The thing that follows it. <laughs> okay, I apologise. The sequel was my idea. I was like, you know what? We might as well. There's only two films Friends in the franchise. The Let's do the whole thing. Yeah. So we are, of course, if you've read the title, we are discussing Lady Snowblood 1 and 2. Yeah. Uh, Lady Snowblood. Yeah. One of my favourite films of all time. I, yeah. I love it. It's got everything that i want you know I, I feel like i said this about house last week mm -hmm. um but yeah it ticks so many boxes for me it was an obvious choice for a podcast episode and i love it and i will spend the next however long telling you how much yeah. i love it the sequel really okay. fucking okay. okay let's make the most of the time when we don't have to talk about the sequel <laughs> let's let's Embrace these precious moments where yes. we don't have to talk about a piece of shit film. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's iconic. It is by far amongst one of the, amongst the most important action films of all time. Um, of course, a major inspiration for uh, Kill Bill. Yeah, I watched Kill Bill first, and, me. and then obviously all of them would say, "Watch Lady Snowblood." Watch. Japanese cinema. I watched Kill Bill when I was really first getting into films. It was one of those films that really got me interested in cinema. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all everyone was saying, well, you got to watch this, you got to watch that. And I watched Lady Snowbird and was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Inspired by. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tarantino. More than that. He made the cast and crew uh, watch DVDs of Lady Snowblood during breaks uh, when he was filming. Yeah. He, he also pretty much stole the whole um, concept. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Let's be honest. That was early 2000s. I This has been influential over the years, even as recent as 2017, where the music video for Rockstar by Post Malone... Uh, uh, references scenes from Lady Snowblood. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's a big part of pop culture and its impact can be seen. I know Jennifer Lawrence, you know, invented strong female characters with the Hunger Absolutely. Games, but, you know, uh, Miko Kaji somehow snuck through. She gave it a best shot. 70s. She gave it a best yeah. shot. It wasn't perfected until Jennifer Lawrence no, came along. No. But but it wasn't she, invented. I don't know how they it did It wasn't. This. No, I, I think they went back in time yeah. and created this. But, you know, let's get it out there straight away. Miko Kaji, legend, mm -hmm. queen, queen of the cinema, just oh, effortlessly beautiful and cool. I love her. Spoiler alert, this isn't the first time she's going to get mentioned this no. month for Japanuary. She's one of my absolute favourites. She fucking sings the theme. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is some queen behaviour right yes. there. Yes. So, yeah, at the end of the day, I had to choose this so everyone can listen to me tell them how much I fucking love this film. Yeah. So we're starting with Lady Snowblood, released in 1973, directed by Toshia Fujita. Yes. Let, okay, let's get it out there right now. Let's make it very clear. I, mm -hmm. and I think Gary as well, apologise for any mispronunciations that we make during this episode. During any of the Japanuary episodes. During any of them. We are trying our best. We are big fans of Japanese culture and Japanese cinema, so we hope that we don't do it too much injustice, but yeah, we're giving it our best shot. We're just two F slurs sitting in a flight and solve for trying our best. Yeah. <laughs> So, director of Revolver, Double Bed, The Miracle of Joe Petrow, Stray Cat Rock, Wild Jumbo and Beat 71, Shinjuku Outlaw, Butter Base, uh, Seduction of Eros, Sweet Scent of Eros, and more. Okay. Um, yeah, so Fujita, he was mainly known for uh, contemporary films. 
So this was his first sort of period piece. And he was chosen by the producers because he'd worked with Miko Kaji in the past mm -hmm. on the Stray Cat Rock films and such. And uh, they'd had a good sort of rapport with each other. And they were so desperate to get Miko Kaji to play the role after the success of Female Prisoner Scorpion that they gave him the, the job of directing. And I have to say he does a fantastic job. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's also written by Kazuo Kamimura. Uh, well, it's based on a story by uh, Kazuo Kamimura was a manga comic author that didn't really write much else. Uh, the same goes for uh, Kazuo Koki, who actually did a little more because uh, he wrote Hanzo the Razor series, Lone Wolf and Cub series, Ani Wabam. Uh, a Killer's Romance, The Dragon from Russia, etc, etc. And also written by Norio Asada, who did Captain Ultra, Gambler's Farewell, uh, Anigo, Under the Flag of the Rising Sun, Rebellion Reward, Number 10 Blues, Goodbye Saigon, Soul of Bruce Lee, Wicked City and more. Yeah, so this is, this is based on a manga. Yeah. So it's kind of... If I'm remembering correctly, the kind of first story of the manga. So the manga goes on longer, but this is, you know, pretty much like a comic book film would, you know, like Iron Man is based on, mm -hmm. you know, a small part of the Iron Man comic yeah, yeah, book yeah, yeah. story. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't find the budget or how much it made, but the moderate financial success, uh, I do know that's a guaranteed thing uh, that happened. Uh, of the first film spawned a sequel that we we're going to talk about today and another adaptation of the original manga titled the princess blade was released in 2001 yeah and there was an was there an, an official there remake was an unofficial remake called broken oath starring angela mayo wasn't yes it? yeah so i'd love to watch that i mean we don't have that actually no we have a few of her films but we don't have that one so, yes, let's talk about who's in the cast. In a section we like to call, hey, I know you. Starting off with Miko Kaji as Yuki Kashima. Uh, Miko Kaji is known for the double suicide of Sunazaki, Female Prison Scorpion series, the Stray Cat Rock series, Retaliation, Blind Woman's Curse, Blood for Blood, uh, The Boss's Head, Lullaby of the Earth, Yakuza Graveyard, Rusty Flames and more. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, she is also an accomplished singer and performs the song in the film. Uh, when Quentin Tarantino used the song in his Kill Bill films, it sparked review renewed interest in her music that inspired her to record and release new songs for the first time in nearly 30 years. Oh, fantastic. She's got a beautiful voice. She has. And I, I love the song. I really love the song. I think she's continued acting. I don't know. I mean, from... A sort of Western perspective, she's seen as almost sort of a cult film star. Yeah. Really. I don't know how big her presence is now mm -hmm. in Japan. Into, I think she's still working, but not... I mean, you'd think she'd be, you know, a big star, really. You, you would think that, but the kind of um, Japanese films that make their way over here... She's not really in them. No. I'm thinking stuff like shoplifters, mm -hmm. and I, I don't yeah. really know how she's seen in Japan. Mm -hmm. If she's a cult film star there, you know, mm. this a, maybe a similar way that we would look at, um, like, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. You know, she... Oh, well, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis has really made a comeback recently, but do you know what I mean? I don't sort of. Mean. I mean, obviously, the 70s was her heyday yeah. for film roles, and, you know... These films were box office successes, mm -hmm. you know, and they have made their way over here and to to the Western countries. So, yeah, it would be interesting to know sort of how she's seen now. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we respect her as a cult film star. She's yeah. A, a legend and a queen. But yeah, that's us. Yeah. And that's our, you know, my mum would have absolutely no idea who she was. <laughs> but yeah, she, she always managed to be the best thing about whatever she's in i mean something like blind woman's curse you know and the sequel to this aren't exactly the best films but you know we still got miko kaji and... yeah yes yeah and i don't she hasn't got the biggest the, the stray cat rock films that we've seen mm -hmm. 
she was I don't think she was really the main focus. Um, but obviously she is in Female Prisoner Scorpion, which yeah. I think was her real big breakout role. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, spoiler alert, that may be the film series we They've discussed. also seen the schedule on social media. <laughs> like in, the, in the map. Um, yeah, so we also have Ko Nishimura, who plays Dokai the Priest. Uh, and he was in High and Low, Yojimbo. The Bad Sleep Well, Matagi, The Temple of Wild Geese, Yosai Garasu, The Left-Handed Sniper, Tokyo Bay, Gang vs. Gang, 13 Assassins, The Glamorous Ghost, and more. Wow, so he worked with Kurosawa. He did, he did. Nice. Uh, we have Toshio Kurosawa, who plays Ryori Ashio, and he is in Evil of Dracula, Yoritora Q, Prophecies of Nostradamus, Too Young to Die, Rugged, Pussy Soup, Right. Father of the Kamikaze. Okay. Police tactics and more. Yeah, what's Pussy Soup about? Um, I assume it is about cats that drink soup. Okay. Cool. And finally, we have Miyoko Akaza, who plays Sayo Kashima. And she was in Super Rich, Cop 7, Affair in the Snow, Secret Female Investigator, Wager on Lips. Wow, I watch Sword that. and Flower, Virgin Blues, So Soft, So Cunning. Ooh. The Adventures of Kazuki Kindaichi, and more. Nice. I want to watch them. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we talk about our first Shall feature presentation? Shall we talk about our first feature presentation? <laughs> ぐれいぬのとぼえげたのおとき死ぬ銀河の重さ見つめて歩く闇を抱きしめるじゃの目の so we start in 1874 uh, A deathly ill woman named Seo Gives birth to a baby girl in a women's prison She names the baby Yuki After the snow outside uh, She says You were born for vengeance, poor child And uh, outside the snow turns a bright red mm-hmm. Beautiful visual you know exactly what you're getting from the start. You know, this is a film that is very much a uh, visual feast. Uh, yeah. Yes. Some of the... And red is the predominant colour. Red yeah. and white. It is some of the greatest cinematography you'll ever see. Yeah. Ever. And just... uh, the this opening scene is a fantastic piece of poetic filmmaking with the finale as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the snow turns red outside. We then get Lady Snowblood, um, title card. And then we cut to a, a grown Yuki, now 20, an assassin going by the name of Shura Yukiheim, Lady Snowblood. Uh, she blocks the path of several men and a rickshaw and kills them and their leader, Shibayama, using a sword concealed in a handle of an umbrella. I mean... That mm-hmm. sword in the umbrella. Yeah. That it, that's not even in the sequel, is it? No, it's not. It's not. No. But it's you know, it, campus tits. Let's it is. be let's be fair. But it's queen behaviour. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, she's slicing off limbs. She is. She's serving a look. The blood is spraying, mm-hmm. and this is something I love about Japanese cinema. Particularly in the 1970s, yeah, is that spray of blood is so over the top. It's so manga. Mm-hmm. It's you know comic book. It's you know so over the top. Yeah, spraying this bright red mm-hmm. everywhere. Big theme of this film is blood red on clean white. Yeah, so like snow. Or clean white clothing. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful visual. They ask Yuki, before she kills them, who are you? And she says, vengeance. 
simply says yeah. vengeance. She was inspired by the Batman 2022 with Robert Pattinson. Oh, okay, cool. So this is Jennifer Lawrence and Robert yes. Pattinson. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. That makes sense, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, it's um, she's a woman of few words. She is. She always has the same expression on her face. And whilst that would usually be something for us to joke about in a usual podcast episode, here it just makes her cool as fuck. Yeah, it's it's a cold stare. It's exactly what the um, character and the film needs. Mm-hmm. And she does it perfectly. Uh, the credits roll now as Miko Kaji herself sings the main theme. And Yuki practices her swordsmanship. Yeah, we love a training montage. Uh, and, yeah, uh, this is this is up there. Training montage, you know. And if you're singing your own song in the background, yeah, you know, it's giving me desperately seeking Susan. <laughs> it's queen behavior. Now we have a narrator for this film, it, and the second we, we do kind of, but we do. So the narrator introduces us to Yuki. And her quest for vengeance. He also references the ever-growing influence of the West and Western values. And this is something that is touched upon a lot in this film. And then really overdone in the second film. Is the political ideals. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the influence of the West and Western values on Japanese culture at the time Mm. and open to interpretations but how I see it and it's something that comes up a lot and we'll discuss further how I see it is that Yuki is in many ways a representation of Japanese culture Mm -hmm. she's always dressed in stunning kimonos yeah she you know is always um sort of She's got the the paraphernalia, I want to say paraphernalia, but you know what I mean. She's she's sort of, uh, her visuals are very much an embodiment yeah. of Japanese culture. Yeah. Uh, narrator says, people say you can't wash away the mud of this world with pure white snow. You need a sura snow, stained fiery red. Well, well that just, that explains the whole film. Yeah, you know that's 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 the one. Yeah, I think themes work here. I I feel like the the voiceover and everything these these little inserts. Um, I, I know it could probably be off putting some, but I think it really works. And one thing about this film is, which the sequel completely doesn't understand, is that despite having these thrown in every now and then, and it, you know the imagery that's presented with the voiceover, like the clips and such that are shown, it's still. A very subtle film. Mm. You know, you've got blood spurting everywhere. You've got these action scenes and everything. You know, you've got all these lovely visuals, but still oddly subtle. Yeah. Yeah. There's a delicacy to... And in Lady Snowblood herself, there's a delicacy to it. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, bang. Yeah. You know, the blood spraying. There's a violence. Mm-hmm. There's... She's... A very quiet character. She's always well put together. She's in many ways... I wouldn't say she's a small character. You know, when when she looks as fierce as she does. Mm. But she's... I suppose really inconspicuous. She's not, you know, shouting. She's not bold and brassy and, you know, classless. Um, and that works because mm-hmm. it's a ju- juxtaposition of yeah. the two. Um, so Yuki appears in a poor village looking for a man named Mats- Matsumon, Matsumon, the leader of an underground organization of street beggars. And uh, she asks him to find her mother's surviving tormentors in return for having killed Shiobama for him. So this is why she's killed to get information from him. Mm-hmm. Um, she, when she goes to meet Matsumon, uh, she's initially surrounded by the street beggars. Yeah. Who chant Pasik around. Yeah. Um, And one of them says the goddess of sex has arrived. Yes. Um, but she manages to fight them off. So, again, we love it. A strong 
female character. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, she's surrounded by these people, you know. Yeah. And she manages to fight them off. And that's the thing. I feel like it also has a lot to say about the treatment of women within Japan at the time as well that it's yeah. based in because. You know, shortly after this, we also have dialogue where someone says, I hear you make your living as an assassin, yet looking at you, you look like you couldn't harm a fly. So the whole idea is the fact that because she's a woman, immediately she's just a sexual object who's, everyone would presume, it would assume is useless and can't do a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and she doesn't, it, and it's one thing that we've seen in similar films. Anibaba. Um, sorry. Anibaba. In, uh, in the way that the women, you know, no one would suspect that they were going around killing yeah, all those no, men. Uh, but what it, it's not what we've seen in, in other films. And in the sense of she doesn't use her sexuality no, she doesn't. No, to no. get ahead. She doesn't use that. And we have no problems with that. You know, it's fierce. But it, it's refreshing to see that. Yeah. Where she isn't reliant mm -hmm. on, you know, promising sexual favors mm -hmm. to get into a certain place yeah and then she cuts off their heads um we then flash back to the story of yuki's mother seo and the four criminals who murder her husband tora yeah so they're literally it's tora seo and their son walking in the in a field mm -hmm. And these criminals come along and they kill Toro. Yeah, and the son. A and the son. But yeah. we don't see that till later. Yeah. But it's just like, it's very jarring. Like, yeah. Even though we've seen the violence already, like this scene felt like the most jarring of, of all of them because, yeah. because of the setup and yeah, just, yeah. And if I remember correctly, her father, he's wearing white mm -hmm. when he dies. Again, yeah. you know, that visual, uh, the clean white clothing of because they seem a, a very well-to-do family uh, like clean white clothing mm -hmm. and the bright red smeared on him and and spraying as opposed to the criminals who are dressed in you know dark crappy clothes uh we then cut back to yuki's birth where seo dies during childbirth and uh, she's pleading with the other inmates to save her baby over herself don't save me just to make sure that baby survives. Uh, we then cut to the body of Seo's son, Shiro, dripping blood into the river, killed by the four criminals just like his father. We then see Seo managing to stab and kill one of her captors whilst he's sexually assaulting her. And uh, it's his murder that she's eventually imprisoned for. Mm -hmm. So they get away with it, but she's imprisoned for that murder. And uh, the, her inmates are speaking to her and she, the, what we're gathering is that she's recounting this story to them. And uh, they say, you know, that's why you said you wanted a strong boy. Mm -hmm. So she, when she was pregnant, she kept saying, I want a strong boy. Well, her, you got a strong girl. So props to you. Seo explains that she reduced, uh, excuse me, she seduced many prison guards in order to conceive Yuki. Her final words are for the child to be raised to carry out the vengeance against the three remaining tormentors. Um, she does acknowledge that the other inmates kept calling her a slur for sleeping with all the guards. <laughs> and oh, okay. <laughs> that makes sense now. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's definitely... The theme of the film is very simple. Yuki has been born with one task. Yeah. That is all. Mm -hmm. That that is. There's nothing else to yeah. it. Yuki is to kill these character, these mm -hmm. criminals that killed her family. Yeah, and you know her mum's dead because of these criminals as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we then cut to uh, Meiji fifteen, which is eighteen eighty two, in, in sort of Western years. And we see the uh, the child Yuki undergo brutal training in sword fighting under the priest Dokai to become her mother's wrath incarnate. This includes what I hope is a dummy being kicked down a hill <laughs> in a barrel. 
<laughs> it's very harsh. And this this is kid. I'm, I'm assuming what like eight or nine. Yeah. And uh, she gets in the barrel. The the actress. And I do. I I'm assuming gets I, I'm dummy, sure it but was. that barrel gets kicked out. And then she can, they cut, so she's like flying out of the barrel. <laughs> So the idea is that she has to force herself to stay in the barrel, and the old guy that's training her, he's he's a fucking horrible guy, and he yeah, but it's to to a a purpose to it. Um, strangely, it includes uh, a moment. Um, strangely and weirdly, where her clothes are cut off mm-hmm. uh, whilst training in sword fighting. Now this is weird in the context of the film because it doesn't happen to Miko Kaji. No. But in the manga, a big sort of point is that she would lose her clothes a lot during battle. Mm. And the filmmakers decided not to include this in the film because they were nervous that the film would end up being like a pink film. Yeah. Which is kind of a, a Japanese version of a sexploitation mm-hmm. film. Um, we how many? We haven't seen that many pink films, I think have we? We've probably seen more than we think, because you'd probably be surprised what's classed as a pink film. Maybe. Um, but I think the decision to not go ahead with it, it's, it's difficult, because, I mean, if Miko Kaji was fully like, yeah, fuck it, let's do mm. it, you know, it could be quite empowering, but... It's being made in 1973. I don't think people are going to look at it as empowering. Like you said, it would probably be classed as a pink film and that would probably be the main selling point of the film. Yeah, yeah. I just, I don't see what purpose it would fit rather than some titillation. Yeah. Um, Because the idea is like, well, why does her clothes come off? Yeah. But then the people that she's having sword fights with, their clothes don't come mm-hmm. off. Like, well... Why is it hers? You yeah. Know? And let's be honest, she's kind of a superhero in many ways. She's almost yeah. superhuman in this film because she is an embodiment of vengeance, mm-hmm. of revenge. Yeah. That is her sole purpose. She isn't humanized really in any way. No. And it's where the sequel sort of messes up a little bit. You know, she is stone faced. She barely speaks. Mm-hmm. She's all action, not words. You know, and she's almost superhuman. Yeah, in her abilities and in her survival, really. Mm-hmm. So, Matsumon's. I've, I, do you know what I've said that different every time I've said it. <laughs> I think you got it right that time. Matsumon's intel leads Yuki to Takimura Banzo, an alcoholic wreck with gambling debts whose daughter, Kobu, works as a prostitute to support him. Uh, Banzo is a fucking dickhead. He is. Uh, He's absolutely horrified that his daughter is selling her body to help fund his gambling and alcohol addictions. Arsehole. But again, you know, the idea of a woman doing it to support a man is again going against the stereotypes that would have been around back then. Yeah. To a certain, uh, I suppose the idea is that, um, I I think a lot in Japanese culture is definitely looking after your elders. Yeah. And being able to provide for them. And I'm assuming that she would have lied in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and say, well, I, I work here mm. rather than what is revealed to Banzo, which is she works as a prostitute and he spends all the money on his gambling addiction and alcohol addiction. Yeah. Um, there's a, a gambling scene with a card game that we saw in a film that we loved recently, um, Pale Flower. Uh, I'm not aware of the card game. No, I have no idea what this card game is. But it looks very interesting. I'd love to find out. Um, it does, it looks a little complicated as well though, but, um, yeah, Yuki takes part in it as well. And yeah. it's, it's actually in Pale Flower as well. The idea of a woman partaking in these gambling card games is blows people's minds, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a sign, obviously a sign of the time that the, the film set in. 
Um, but she takes place, but it, it turns out that Banzo is cheating. Yeah. And uh, Yuki convinces the gambling house's owners to pardon Banzo. And uh, Yuki leads him to the beach and remorselessly kills him after revealing her identity. Um, Banzo offers up his daughter when he's threatened with punishment by he the does. gambling house. He also says, don't kill me, don't slay me. It's late for that. He does say, yeah, he does say that to Yuki on the beach. He does. Uh, Yuki and uh, Kabui uh, meet twice. So uh, Kabui being uh, Banzo's daughter. Again, another word I think I'm pronouncing differently every time I say it. Uh, but his daughter's pleasant demeanour it brings on, I thought, an uncharacteristic, em a hint of emotion mm. from Yuki. Yeah. Her sort of pleasant demeanour and her openness and, and talking to Yuki and... Yeah. You know, that maybe that pleasantry that she hadn't seen for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly with the way she was raised, yeah. you know, and the interactions we've seen with people up until this point. Um, yeah, she says, I will never forgive nor spare you. And he says, don't slay me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she then drags, she kills him on the beach. But just for good measure, drags him from the beach to the top of a cliff just to throw him off. Yeah, that's definitely his actual body. It's definitely not a dummy. <laughs> yeah. Very, very stiff body. <laughs> very stiff. The arms don't move at all, or the legs. It almost does the Sharon Stone when it <laughs> starts, like, spinning <laughs> on the way down. Uh, but yeah, what a queen. It's like, it's, it's, you know what? I will slay you. I'll slay you on the beach, and I'll chuck your fucking ass off the cliff. Yeah. See you later, dickhead. Uh, Yuki then learns that the last of her mother's rapists... Zukamoto Gishiro had suspiciously died in a shipwreck three years prior when she first uh, attempted to find him. She's absolutely slaying in lilac. She is. She it is her best colour. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. She looks beautiful in lilac. And uh, she's at his grave and she's fucking, she's absolutely fuming. And she attacks Gishiro's tombstone in frustration. Uh, she then finds herself being followed by a reporter named Ryuri Ashio, and she warns him to stay away from her. Now, this was when I first watched, I was like, oh, love interest, mm. fuck's sake. You know, I was like, pissed off, let's be fair. Um, Ryuri's hair. Something. It's something. It's Do 1973. You, it's given 1973. I don't think they had sideburns like that in 1894. No. <laughs> it's dead. Yeah. It's de he's, he's a very handsome man and a very 1973. <laughs> um, Ashio learned of Yuki's story from Dokai, who persuaded him to publish it as a means to draw out one of Seiyo's tormentors, Kitahama Okano. Uh, Kobu reads the story and she's fuming about Ashio um, and he verifies its accuracy. Uh, so Kabui being Banzo's daughter. Um, not sure why. Because Yuki pretty much did her a favour. Yeah. Getting rid of her arsehole. It's true. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, <laughs> Ashio tells Kabui that they were born under unlucky stars, both you and her. So they're both kind of a product of their, you know, genealogy, the DNA. Yeah. You know, they're both kind of having to deal with the issues mm -hmm. of their parents and have probably had to all their lives. Mm -hmm. So they're not too dissimilar in that sense. Um, so the plan to draw out Kitahama Okano works and she sends men to kidnap Ashio, threatening him with torture for Yuki's location, but Ashio refuses to tell. Yuki enters Okono's estate and kills several of Okono's men. Okay, no. She doesn't just enter the estate. <laughs> Her fucking purple umbrella she sword does. flies down from the roof, lands in the ground... And then she fucking murders everyone. It does. It does. It is in my notes. It I'm is. Just, I'm giving you the story, tits. then I'll give you, you know, 
the explanation. Um, but yeah, so she she kills several with, absolutely slayed with that umbrella. It's pretty camp. It yes. is pretty camp. Uh, Yuki and Rayuri find Okono's dying body hanging within a room. So they they pursue her. Um, they've killed all her men, and she takes the coward's way out and hangs herself before they can kill her. Um, so she thinks. Yuki, hearing Okano's dying heartbeat, yeah, slices her she in half. She fucking slices her she in half. She slices that bitch in half. And I think it's an incredible scene. It is. And uh, again, I, I, this is the same film that I said is a subtle film. You, you know, it makes scenes like this more effective because the camera doesn't cut away. Mm. It's not left to the imagination. You actually see it in full. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's that weird kind of beautiful violence that the Japanese do very well mm -hmm. and Italian horror films Dario Argento do very well mm -hmm. that kind of death but in kind of an almost beautiful and kind of glorious way yeah. in, in, in many ways and this one the eye contact that Okono's eyes mm -hmm. staring at the camera slash Yuki before she's uh, quite graphically, like you said, cut in half mm -hmm. with the usual spray of blood. I mean, it, it's cinematic perfection. Yes. I, I think it just looks amazing. Yeah, yeah really just, yeah, well done. Uh, Ashio is visited by his father, Gishiro. Gasp. 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 The one who uh, we thought was dead. And he, he reveals that he faked his death when he learned of Yuki's plan for vengeance. Gishiro can't be asked though, as he's got a big fish to fry. Yes. <laughs> he's got bigger fish to fry, helping the Japanese military for the upcoming war that will grow the empire. And uh, he decides his time would best suited to plan a masquerade ball that evening. Yes. Where rich people can get up to some hedonist hedonistic behaviour. Um, and that's his words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so another little political mm. thing here. Um, he can't be asked. He hasn't got time for this, whatever this is. Uh -huh. um, he, he doesn't really care or even really know what it's all about just this silly woman who's following him um that he could probably easily you know deal with and he's got bigger fish to fry with the military in the upcoming war and and such and planning his well masquerade ball um she and oh excuse me um ashio spills the tea straight away to Yuki, he does. doesn't he? He does. <laughs> and uh, Yuki's like, no, nah, not on my watch. And she uh, she goes to kill him. She uh, she goes to Gashiro's masquerade ball and uh, kills a man acting as a decoy. How does she kill him? <laughs> she uh, cuts off both of his hands and then rips off a very convincing mask. It's almost yeah. as if. The actual actor was playing him up until the point where the moustache wow. and beard had to come yeah. off. <laughs> um, what's interesting about the, the masquerade ball is that all the guests, apart from Yuki, are dressed in Western attire. Mm -hmm. uh, like late Victorian uh, attire. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yuki really sticks out yeah. in her traditional Japanese clothing. Because she's got the best outfit in the room. She's got the best outfit in the room. It's the brightest, it's, you know, but she really sticks out. She's masqueraded, so no one knows who she is. Um, but she's also the only woman that we see who's not asked to dance mm -hmm. by any of the lecherous rich old men. So I think that's quite, and I think that's obviously a deliberate thing that yeah. the filmmakers did. The idea that the the women dressed in Western attire are the ones being asked to dance. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of left by herself in her traditional yeah. Japanese um, kimono. Uh, Ashio and Yuki find and follow the real Gashiro, who shoots Ashio. Wounded, Ashio grapples with Gashiro and stops him from shooting Yuki as she swings on a lamp. Yes, queen. <laughs> Uh, between balconies disturbing the pigeons as she does <laughs> it. Uh, Yuki stabs through Ashio into Gashiro's chest. 
She then cuts Kashira's throat as he shoots her. He falls over a railing and onto the ground full of guests. Now what I noticed when he falls from the balcony is that it's between a American flag and a Japanese flag mm -hmm. of equal size. Yeah. So again, you know, it, it's more subtle, but it's interesting. Yeah. The idea, this guy is falling between American values and Japanese values. Mm -hmm. And he's a shady dude, yeah. you know? And further evidence of just like how cold Yuki has become over the years, the fact that Ashio is like the only sort of person in this film uh, that she's had some sort of connection with. And, you know, he was shot, but... There's nothing saying he was actually dead, but she absolutely does not hesitate to stab him through him to get to his father. No, no. And I think, again, um, he is a victim of his father's misdoings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. L literally. I mean, mm -hmm. they die together on the same sword. Yeah. You know, and it's a, a really interesting theme throughout the film is, of course, this idea, you know, with the whole plot of us being really a product of our family history, mm -hmm. of our parents, and how ultimately we can never really get away from that. No. Or at least they can't. Um, Yuki, wounded, stumbles outside where she is stabbed by a waiting kabui who has been pursuing Yuki all this while in her own quest to avenge her father's murder. Yuki manages to escape, only to collapse on the snow, apparently dead. The following morning, however, she opens her eyes. Yeah. And, and that's the end. Again, like I said at the start of when we were discussing the film, it's very poetic in the way that it starts with her being born, blood and snow, ends with her seemingly dying, blood and snow, mm -hmm. and... The visuals match up perfectly. The cinematography in this final sequence is incredible. And you, you'd you have to be... Uh, yeah, you'd have to be a bit silly not to recognise the similarities between the finale of Kill Bill and the finale of this. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I thought it was poetic also, the idea that Yuki being born of vengeance for her father's and, and her brother's murder mm -hmm. is eventually killed, or so it seems, mm. by someone avenging their father's murder. Now, yeah. if the father deserved it, you know, that to, to Kabui, that's not, that's, it doesn't matter. You know, Yuki killed her father yeah. and she gets her revenge. And it's why Yuki doesn't, I don't think, really reacts mm -hmm. when she stabs her. Because I think she understands. Yeah. Because that's her Her whole life has been dedicated mm -hmm. to the same thing. Yeah. So again, they're both born, uh, and, was it, they're both born under the same star. Was yeah. It, he said, you know, they're both very similar in that sense. And I think it's very poetic. And, uh, yeah, the fi the film ends, her job is done, mm -hmm. her one task. Yeah, she opens her eyes, you know, at the end, so she's not, you know, fully dead. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea is that we're at a conclusion now, and her story is at a conclusion. Yeah, and really. it could have just ended there, no sequel, standalone <laughs> yeah. film, and it would have been perfect. Uh, it would have yeah. been perfect, because it is a perfect film. Yes, yeah, it it really is. I I just think it's so beautiful, and it's it's very similar to to House, uh, that we discussed last week, where I can't really do justice to the no. beautiful visuals. No, um, the the snow, the blood, the outfits, you know, the, the costume design, the cinematography, the soundtrack is all so beautiful and. But such a violent film. Yeah. Um, it's a very sort of really over the top, mm -hmm. bloody violence yeah. in this film. That it's great juxtaposition. And um, yeah, I just think it's fantastic. It is. Fully entertaining, like really entertaining. Yeah. But also with some depth there, you know, with mm -hmm. some 
interesting ideas and interesting themes running through it. Yeah, for a film to nail all of that with, you know, everything is spot on. The pacing, the themes, the violence, everything is... The acting, the cinematography, the soundtrack, it is just a perfect film. Yeah, yeah. And really, just, it, it's... In, in my opinion, really personifies what I love mm-hmm. about Japanese cinema. Yeah. Because it is so inherently Japanese as well. Really a celebration of Japanese culture, mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Uh, what's your rating? My rating is... Uh, what is my rating? 10 Miko Kaji death stares out of 10. Because I forgot to say, she does do a mean death she stare. She does. She does. She really does. Uh, mine is 10 overdramatic blood spurts out of 10. Of course. Uh, and Masterpiece, Trash Piece, Trash or Basic is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It really is. And it's available on Blu-ray and video on demand. And if you enjoyed this, I recommend checking out Kill Bill Volume 1. Yes, of course. Kill Bill. If you enjoyed this, watch the film again. But with Uma Furman. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you want to watch the film, a very similar film with a male lead, I fully recommend the Lone Wolf and Cub yes, series of films. Definitely. And that sadly brings us to our second film of the episode, Lady Snowblood 2, Love Song of Vengeance, 1974, the title that makes no sense. It doesn't. Do you know what also no, it makes no sense? The film's existence. The, the, the word snow. <laughs> because there ain't no fucking snow. Yes, the film that lacks the blood spurts, apart from the last five minutes, lacks the action, lacks the Miki, M- Miko Kaji doing her absolute best, lacks the song, lacks the snow, lacks the cinematography. Now, I would I would be inclined to say this is a cheap cash-in of it, a sequel. Well, which, it, it, well, really, I would be inclined to say that, and it does feel like it, but it's based on a manga, and... As far as I know, the manga continued after that story. And I, if I remember correctly, the manga did deal with Lady Snowbird becoming an assassin for hire. As far as I know, mm-hmm. or, or can remember. Um, so it, it wasn't completely against, you know, the realm of possibility that this would get a sequel she opened her eyes at the end Mm -hmm. you know much like terror the terror train remake (laughs) she opened her eyes at the end what i have a problem with is how shit this is (laughs) well it completely goes against everything really that made the first one great i know we said that you know it, it really brings the the first one comes to a fantastic conclusion there's not need another it's not need a sequel and everything yeah but you have got the Kabui character there, and I feel like there's still an interesting story that could be told there if you're going to stretch it out to a sequel. Mm. Yeah. You could have carried on from the moment that film ended, and you could have made something great. It's the exact same team. So directed by Toshia Fujita, written by Kazuo Kamimura, Kazuo Koiki, Kuyu Hide Ahora is an additional writer this time around, who also wrote Sukiban, Urataraman, Taro... Uh, Savage Beast Goes Mad, Nuclear Gypsies, Magical Chinese Girl Pai Pai, and more. And uh, Norio Asada also returns to write. So you've got an additional writer as well this time on board. Same team as the as the previous film. Uh, again, I can't tell you how much it made or how much it was made for. But how can you go so wrong? This genuinely feels like it was a different film and at the last minute they're like oh it was popular oh lady snow let's throw her in it does which definitely isn't the case but it does feel like that it, yeah it kind of yeah we'll, we'll get to it we're not gonna go we'll, too in we'll, we'll talk about who's one, in hopefully. it oh who's in it well i don't know you gotta say the section first yeah who's in it that's not what it's called it's, i'm giving it the energy it deserves who is in this Mika Kaji's back. She is. Uh, starring alongside her is Juzo Itami as Ransu Tokunaga. Uh, he was in The Funeral, Tampopo, A Taxing Ooh. Woman, Tales of a Golden Geisha. Oh, of course he was. Of course he was in Tampopo. Yes. I love that he film. He was in Sweet Home, Bumpkin Soup. Is he really? Yeah. I love that film too. It's um, a great film. Play at Boogie Woogie, Island of the Evil Spirits, I Am a Cat. 
and more. Nice, I am a cat. I'd like to watch that. Now. Kazuko Yoshiyuki as Aya Takunaga was in Departures, Ponyo, Empire of Passion, My Second Brother, The Landlady, Gold Woman, Nurse in Black, Sparkle of Life, Seven Days of Himawari, and Her Puppies. Her Puppies? Yeah. And more. I'm assuming that's not what I think it is. I, I think it's actual puppies. Oh, okay. Stars. There we go. Yoshi... <laughs> Yoshio Harada as Shizuki Tukunaga uh, was in Ronin Guy, Anibi, Suzuki Loses His Lover. Poor Suzuki. Yeah. Uh, it's Easier Than Kissing, Zatoichi The Last, Chicken Is Barefoot, Nine Souls, Singapore Sling. Uh, it's Easier Than Kissing, I've wrote twice on there for some reason, and more. I think you're desperate to see that film. And finally, Shin Kishida as... Uh, Sashiro Kikui uh, was in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, Lone Wolf and Cub, Baby Cut of the River Styx, and Baby Cut in Peril, Evil of Dracula, Lake of Dracula, Zatoichi meets Yojimbo, and more. Wow, so we've just seen a few of his films. Yeah, so, I mean, fairly prolific cast. Yeah. And they... Lots of men. Start in this. Lots of men. Yes, for our second feature presentation. <laughs> あ、さめがば主人には金十三万米八百。以上、お支払い泣き場合には諸君の首を差し押さえる。よろしく。選ぶ大将君。So we open with Yuki at her mother's grave. Uh, it's ten years later, and uh, but obviously in real life it's one year later. Mm, yeah. Now I don't think for a second Miko Kaji would age, but she definitely hasn't aged these ten years. Well, no. <laughs> um, she uh, Yuki is on the wanted list for her previous crimes and is being chased by the authorities. Well, she starts the film in the same position as she did at the end of the first film. At, you know where she was when she opened her eyes. It's like, okay, they know what they're doing here. That's, you know, that's a good parallel. Yes. Here we go. Yeah. It's so really good. it's the same position 10 years later and she's at her mother's grave. Yeah. What's happened in these 10 years, I'm assuming she's just being... Slaying. Slaying and um, sort of trying to escape from the authorities. Um, it happens a couple of times. At one point, she stumbles upon a march of soldiers, mm -hmm. women and children, waving Japanese flags. Uh, <laughs> they're chanting something and, and referring to the brave troops in foreign lands. Yes. Immediately, you know, subtleties out the window. Yes. Um, this is a political film, and it's not going to let you forget about it. It's not. The narrator, much like the first well, film... I mean, before that, we, we have to mention, because it's one of the, like... Two times it happens in the film. What? Uh, no, sorry, three times it happens in the film. She's attacked by a gang of guys and she slays all of them. Uh, Literally. Yes. Um, but, jarring enough, jarringly enough, the first thing you I noticed, no fucking blood spurts. No. She was slicing these guys left, right and centre and there was no blood whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I was worried. I was like, okay, we're going downhill here. It is. So she fights off a group of guys. Mm -hmm. Is this the one where she escapes on a horse? No. No, that's the next one. Is this the one where she's tied up? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so she's tied up. Oh, oh is this the one after? Either way, we get the voiceover. <laughs> we, get the, we get the narrator and he tells us... Um, it gives, well, it gives us a history lesson of 1905. He does, he does. He? Did yeah. you have any of that down? Yeah, I, the Russo-Japanese War ended September 38th, year of Meiji, uh, 1905. 
Uh, yeah, it ended. 370,000 Japanese soldiers gave their lives to secure this victory to ensure that capitalism would be the driving force of the Japanese Empire. However, the post-war inflation was severe and the people, as voiceless as ever, could only fume in silence. Around this time, one woman, one queen, one icon, one moment, continued her journey along the road of carnage. Her name was Yuki Kashima, known to some as Lady Snowblood. So it's, it's definitely, and you know, it, it's a political stance we agree on. It's, you know, it's an anti-war sort yeah. of rhetoric. Much like the first one, but it was way more subtle in the first there's, one. There's plenty of great Japanese anti-war films. Yeah, no, absolutely. Go and watch those instead. Yeah. Um, so after, after this, there's another scene where she fights off a group of men. And she's tied up with rope, isn't she? Yeah. And she's sort of having to fight them off whilst this rope is around her. And she's very much giving Rachel Stevens <laughs> in the Sweet Dreams of My LAX <laughs> music video. You know when she's got all the ribbons? No, I can't say I, I got that comparison. But Okay, you. well, I will show you. I, I'm aware. You I just know. I didn't put the two together. Well, they're together now. Thank you. Uh, this is the one where she escapes on horseback. Yeah. Uh, when Yuki is then on a beach, after meeting some random guy. Yeah, the, I, I don't know, know who the random. I don't know if because. Yeah, he'd, he'd have been saying something about the fucking war. That's yeah, crazy. something like that. And then she's surrounded by policemen on the beach. She fights and kills several of them, but is eventually overwhelmed. Um. In what is oh, a nice visual, she throws her sword high in the air and uh, kind of almost shamefully lowers her, s her head as she surrenders to the policeman. There's absolutely no way this bitch would have been overwhelmed by her. No, no and then the sword, like Excalibur, goes into the beach and then we get the opening credits. Uh, don't the we? fucking joke of an opening credit Type where the, the score is just, it's fine. And I'm like, okay, this time last film, we had a fucking Miko Kaji song here, and now we're getting this shit. Yeah. So she's quickly tried and sentenced to death by hanging. And she's to be sent to the same prison that she was born in, slash her mother died in. She doesn't make it there, though. She's suddenly rescued by the mysterious Shishiro Kikui, head of secret police. And... His men in cherub masks. Yeah, one of them just, I mean, he just pulls stupid faces out of it. He does, yeah, I do. It's, yeah. It felt like an attempt at comedy, and it's like, really, do you know what you're the sequel to? Inside his headquarters, he propositions Yuki to spy on an enemy of the state, the anarchist Ransui Tokunaga. Ransui is in possession of a critical document, which Shiro seems quite obsessed with deeming it highly dangerous to the stability of the government. If Yuki can obtain and deliver the document to Toshiro, she will grant her immunity from her charges. Yeah, and he says to her that if, you know, if she doesn't do it and he lets her go, she'll be hunted like a dog. At, at this point, she should have been like, so why the fuck would I care? I can, just, last I can years murder anyway. anyone who fucking chases me. Exactly. Um, Yuki <sighs> infiltrates Rensui's home posing as a maid oh you missed an important part i didn't you did i didn't random children running through the street shouting japan won japan won the russians yes. lost <laughs> yeah i didn't i didn't miss that <laughs> just in case you forgot very subtle very <laughs> subtle yeah yuki infiltrates rensui's home posing as a maid and sets about looking for the document on the streets the children are chanting about how japan has sunk the russian ships <laughs> on her search for the document. And then this is... I mean, this is Lady Snowblood. We've watched a whole film of her kicking ass. Yeah. Pretty much superhero, superhuman, you know, the personification of vengeance. And now we're watching her clean floors. Yeah, it is in sort of. Yeah. On her search for the document, Yuki witnesses <laughs> in a strange series of events, <laughs> Ransui giving his wife Aya a good scene to... Yes. This unfortunately includes some foot licking. Okay, you gotta stop kink shaming on this fucking podcast. <laughs> I don't like feet. Yes, but many people do. Yes. Do you know who does? Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. It's another piece to the Tarantino puzzle. Another piece to the puzzle. If you like sucking on some feet, good for you. 
Yeah. I'm not shaming anybody for it. It's just not for me. And I'm allowed to say <laughs> that I don't want to see people's feet getting licked whilst I'm watching <laughs> Lady Snowblood. I'm allowed to say that. I have absolutely no problem with anybody enjoying a bit of foot licking. Yeah. And no issues. And to to really apologize for how disgusted he was, you can send Chris any pictures of you licking feet that you like. I prefer videos. <laughs> um yeah. Um Ransui is also a bit handsy with Yuki as well. And uh, he way he that. grabs her backside and says, "I'm an anarchist, you see, but I'm even more a pervert." Nice. Um, and I'm just in my head. I'm like, because we, we've watched these films back to back. We, we're well aware of Lady Snowblood, but watching the first one and watching the second one and thinking, okay, kick his ass. No, yeah, she'd fucking kick. You know, she'd fucking. Cut his head cut off. Cut his fucking <laughs> hand off. She cut his knob off. Like she would touch in your ass. And but she, it just seems to like okay. And she brings him tea, and he swings around in slow motion. We get to see the shot twice for some reason. Yeah. Screams at her and points a large stick at her because he's on edge because he has a lot of enemies. But okay, no, she would not stand for this shit. No, no. Um, the more she observes Ransu, Ransu. I'm gonna say Ransu, Ransu. The more shit... I'm so sorry. I really, really apologise. No, Ransu. Okay. I'm going to say Ransu. You, you go, girl. I fully apologise. The more she questions the path Shishiro has put on her. When Ransu confides in Yuki, knowing full well who she is, asking her to deliver the document to his, br to his brother Shizuki, Yuki is forced to decide her allegiance. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't take long to decide. No. Uh, Ransu takes Yuki to a pet cemetery <laughs> where his fellow anarchist friends have been buried, deemed unfit for graves in a human cemetery. Okay. <laughs> Political. You know, we get it. We get it. You know, unfit for uh, normal, you know, because they're anarchists, they're leftists, you know. Ransu tells Yuki about the mistreatment of young, hardworking labourers and the violence enacted on the anarchists by the secret police. The document uh, Shishiro is after is a letter to his mother proving that the rebellion is a fabrication and if the media get a hold of it, it will cause an uprising against the authorities on a giant scale. So that's the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? MacGuffin. The plot of Star Wars A New Hope. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's the MacGuffin of the piece. It's the this letter that Shishiro had sent to his mother. This is what I got. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little confused at times during the film. I was honestly half asleep at times during the film. Y yeah, you did maybe nod off a little bit. Uh, so if All of this is done at a snail's pace, by the way. An absolute snail's pace. Ransu and Yuki are stopped by the police and Yuki is shot, but escapes by jumping into the river. She ends up at a slum-like village where she's nursed back to health. Ransu has been arrested and is being beaten by the secret police for the whereabouts of Yuki. So it's kind of, very, in some ways, quite similar to the first one. No. Ransu's wife witnesses the torture and goes to speak to Yuki, who is being looked after by a young anarchist called Shizuki Tokunaga. Now, Shizuki Tokunaga is the doctor... He also has the same wig that uh, the guy from the previous film had. Yes. And he doesn't mince his words, does no. he? Um, what does he say about the slum <laughs> that they're in? Some even have their willy sticking out. <laughs> Disgusting! He does. <laughs> he says to Ransu's wife, take a good look around you. They're all garbage. That one's <laughs> willy is hanging out. No, he literally says some even have their willy <laughs> sticking out. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure whose side he's on, but, no. like, in terms of the politics of the film, mm -hmm. I mean, like, why is he being so, like, rude yeah. about these, you know, he's, on one hand, there's this idea that, like, oh, the anarchists and, you know, the, the poor are being mistreated and such, yeah, yeah. and then the doctor in the village is like, look at these fucking <laughs> tramps, dirty <laughs> bastards. <laughs> Shitting in the street, you <laughs> anyway. 
Um, Yuki manages to stop an assassination attempt on her. <laughs> And uh, the would-be assassin is tortured by Shizuki and Ko for information, but he won't budge, eventually escaping, rendering the whole thing a little pointless. Okay. Stops an assassination <laughs> attempt. She takes a blind guess and throws a knife on the says, ceiling. Well, she can hear. Uh, well, we couldn't fucking hear. Yeah, but she's the super-duper assassin. She super threw a fucking knife on. Yeah, but this is how it should be. Yeah. She's super... Yeah, yeah she's... That's fine. He man. But when Shira. but when you've been watching a film for the past fucking hour, how long it had been on at this point? When you've been watching a film it, for that it, it long wasn't a, of really... a woman being taken care of well, by men oh, wow. or a fucking a woman being bossed around by men the entire time are doing absolutely fuck all. She did fuck it's all. very jarring when she randomly throws a knife and manages to get it straight through someone's hand. She spends way too much time in bed. I forgot it's the same character from the first one. Do you film. remember when we watched The Mirror Cracked? <laughs> and I was so looking forward to watching Angela Lansbury's Miss Marple. She spent fucking three quarters of the film in bed. That's exactly what this is. That's exactly what this is. Uh, a, be a beaten Ransu is dropped off at the village and he's been poisoned. His wife seeks revenge. I think he was poisoned. This was another thing that confused I me. I mean, he was tortured with a kettle for one minute. He either and... was, but he was over points. I swear someone said he's been poisoned. Yeah, with the plague. But then with the plague. Yeah. The, the, plague, the, the plague. The plague. The plague that's randomly introduced that's been created by the secret police. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense then. So he's got the plague. His wife's, then why would they drop him? Okay. His wife seeks revenge on the police officer. The one with the Sherlock Holmes hat that's been following you, that was following Yuki at the beginning and randomly popped up every so often, but I'm not sure why he was the target. Um, but she she stabs him in the eye, which caught me off guard a little bit. I was like, oh, finally, a little something's happening. And uh, she gets herself killed in the process. Now, Ransu dies too, and they're both laid to rest in a burning boat. Shizuki reads them both to absolute filth mm -hmm. for making poor choices. And he also spills a little bit of tea when he reveals that Aya was his ex-wife. Yeah. He says, you are my wife. What did you see in him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. As they're laid to rest. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he doesn't mince his words, does he? No. Yuki goes to see Shishiro and blackmails him with the document and insinuates she may have... The for some... <laughs> she challenges him to some sort of duel and he plan and then he agrees to it and he says, Will you stay here in the mansion? I've got to prepare for our duel. And if you if you win, I have everything that you have. If you win, I have you have every or whatever. But she has nothing and he has everything. I, I didn't really get what was going on there. She said that he's maliciously exploiting the, the troubled times to make money from war and such, which is, you know, it's interesting, but it's so sort of ham-fisted and not dealt with very well in, in the film. Do you know, in the film, uh -huh. it's um, not dealt with the best. Instead of the duel, which would have been a really interesting scene, yeah, he decides he's going to burn the village down, which he does. He burns the village down, and mm. I question why he didn't just do that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why didn't he just... I mean, it, it, I'm, confu it, I'm confused by the whole thing, because this whole film could have been dealt with a lot sooner yeah, than it was. It and I think that's why it feels so long, is because he ends up burning down the village and killing a lot of people. So he knew where the village was. Mm -hmm. He knew that's where she was. Why didn't he just do that? Yeah. Um, Yuki is still at his mansion, though. Because he told her to stay there. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> she manages to escape after killing his henchmen. And she returns to the village, which has now been burnt down fully. And everyone is dead except for Shishiro, conveniently, who still has the document. In his hand, mm -hmm. conveniently, and it's really clean considering yeah. everywhere around is ashes. So Yuki and Shizuki go, to, uh, yeah, yes, Yuki and Shizuki go to confront Shishiro, killing everyone and rendering the whole thing completely pointless. Mm -hmm. It's pointless because if they have this document, and they were using the document to blackmail him, 
but then end up just killing him anyway without gaining anything from the blackmail mm -hmm. with the document and everyone dying. What was the fucking point? I know. What I know. was the point of any of this? Um, Shizuki is harmed during this showdown and uh, he dies after Yuki finishes him off and she sheds a few tears showing a bit of emotion and the end yeah also within those last 15 minutes it remembered it was a lady snowblood film and we actually got some blood spurts yeah it and felt we, like we got some actual sort of sword play if they were filming it chronologically it felt like they were waiting on a delivery of the blood and then it just arrived yeah. And like, oh yeah shit we can include yeah. it now oh my god what a load of fucking shit it it was it was very messy i thought very messy and it kind of took away from a lot of what the first film established. Yes. The first film, Yuki was a fearless bitch who didn't take any rules from anyone. Yeah. She was doing her own thing. But then this entire film, she's just fucking being bossed around. Yeah. Being bossed around, protected by men, just... it. It's not the same character. No, no. The first film felt like it came full circle. Yeah. She was born and... She she died, or it came to a conclusion. She was and, born, she served and, and she died. She did. But she did what she was born to do. Serve cut. Full circle. One film, you know, succinct. Yeah. Perfect. Masterpiece. Yeah? Yeah. So this film, I wish had just redone the whole fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. Because it didn't warrant its existence. No. Because... Because the first film felt it came to a logical conclusion, this film had to really do something to, you know, warrant its existence. Yeah. And it, it didn't because it changed so much from the first film. It felt really removed from the... The characters felt removed from mm -hmm. the first film, particularly Yuki. Yeah. You know, Lady Absolutely. Snowblood, who isn't in the film as much. No. There's too much of... This male presence. Mm. The plot is confusing and kind of pointless. You know, whereas the first film had a very simple plot. Mm -hmm. Get revenge. Yeah. Seek revenge. You know, it's something we've seen, like um, Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. The, the films I've seen of that, they, they have a very similar structure, mm. really. And they're enjoyable. Yeah. It's like when you go from watching Real Housewives of Beverly Hills to watching Real Housewives of New Jersey. You know, you've got some of the same in there. You can see a trace of it. But then most of the time, you're just showing the fucking husbands. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It, it just didn't... For a sequel that didn't have to exist, it, I wish it had just rehashed the first film. So I could sit here and say, I had a fun time. Did it break any new ground? No, but I had fun. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have fun. No. It was it was very tedious. No, I was bored. Up it my was mind. very tedious. Well, what rating did you give it? Um, there were glimmers, little glimmers of goodness. Um, I gave it four Rachel Stevens choreographed rope numbers out of ten. Well, I was less generous and gave it <laughs> two Willie sticking out out of ten. Yes. Um, has to be trash, be trash or basic. I just gave it a trash. That was fucking trash for me. Um, uh, I don't know. I gave it basic, mm. which is worse than trash. Yeah, in my in my opinion. Um, if for some reason you want to watch it, it's on. It's part of the Blu-ray box set from Arrow. Uh, it's also on video on demand. And if you enjoyed this, I recommend checking out Revenge of Lady Street Fighter, another pointless, lazy sequel. But at least you get to watch the entire first film again. Yeah. I just said Lone Wolf and Cub series for both, really. If if you enjoyed that, you'll get lots of enjoyment out of the Lone Wolf and Cub series of films. And, for and you... any, you know, watch... Do you know what you should watch? What? Female Prisoner Scorpion. Yeah. Before we discuss it at the uh, end of the month. On to the awards. Yes. Now, we'll be giving out uh, awards as a whole to see who wins. Spoiler alert, the second one's not getting any awards. Um, unless you have any for it. Um, no, I don't. No. Biggest queen, of course. It's Yuki. There's, it's there's no other answer. Lady Snowblood herself. 
she yeah she's up there with the best yeah. in my opinion biggest gasp uh, i have the flashback to uh sayo's husband and child being murdered and her sexual assault in the first film yeah yeah um yeah it's a good choice i am um, i said okono cut in half yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, best dialogue I have don't kill me don't slay me I agree with don't slay because me because the thing is you know we always have a bit of funny dialogue here yeah. it's not really they're not really quotable films um, no the, 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 there's not much dialogue really it, it's not a huge part of the film and being gay you know it has to be don't slay me don't slay me I, I was a little boring and I put people say you can't wash away the mud of this world with pure white snow what you mean? You need a Sura Snow stained fiery red. You were quite boring. What you mean? You actually went for the best dialogue. Yeah. <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> no, I just I thought it was. It's from the narrator, but um, I thought it was sort of perfectly encapsulated what the film was about, and it was mm -hmm. quite poetic. So I, I quite appreciated it. And that's camp. I have Yuki thrown her purple sword umbrella to the ground to inform the bad guys she has arrived. Yes, I completely agree. It's actually a film. Rather devoid of camp. Apart from the outfits and the umbrella. Yeah. yeah but I, I didn't think they were necessarily camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, that moment was camp, and that's why I chose mm. it as well. But I thought she slayed so hard. She did. It, it transcended camp, and it was mm. just fierce. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a 34-year-old white guy in school. Pulling out all the words from the gay dictionary. And I'm just saying... Fierce, yes, queen. What, but it's what, true. There's what no should other, I be saying as a gay man? There's no other words to describe just how amazing she is. Yeah. You, you have to go full drag race reference. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, if you are a fan <laughs> of Lady Snowblood and you think she's fierce, let us know on social media. Fierce. We're Horror Cult Trash over on Facebook and, Hint and Instagram. Instagram. Horror Cult Trash on Twitter. And they're like Gaz92 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and Gazcruz92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. And the final deadline is approaching for Gasp Festival. So if you want to submit some films, then now's your time. You've got until February 6th, uh, and you can do that on Film Freeway. Search Gasp Horror Festival, and you can check us out on social media, Gasp Horror Fest, across all the usual stuff. Yes, if you love Fierce Queens in cinema, Gasp is the one. Yes. We're going to have plenty. Including myself hosting it. Absolutely. Uh, no doubt in my mind. Give us a rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, like a follow and everything else. We're back on Friday. Taking Why? a brief, brief interruption from Japanuary to give you another Friday the 13th bonus episode where we'll be talking about Jason Lives, which actually does have tie to a bit of Japanese cinema. Oh, are you saving that little tidbit for I am, Friday? I am. Um, I mean, I I noticed the tie. I don't know if it's official, but I would say it's it's got to be. Okay. There's no denying it. So tune in on Friday for Jason Lives. Yes. And, and so Jason will we. Lives. Yeah. Hopefully you'll live whilst listening. Uh, <laughs> next week, we'll be back with another double feature. <laughs> Where we're bringing you, and Fuck we had to do know. it. It's January. We had to do a kaiju double feature. Uh, and I know you're thinking, oh, I bet they're bringing us some of the best kaiju films. They've only spoke about masterpieces so far. Nope. We're bringing you two of the worst. We're talking about All Monsters Attack, starring Godzilla and his son Manila, and Camera Super Monster, starring some fierce queens. Yes. Yeah, so we we don't want to end without a bit of trash. Oh, we still got way more to go for, for Japan January. Pleasure. We've still got three episodes after that. We really in Japan January. Yeah. January is a long month. Yes. Uh, but yeah, we'll see you same time, same place on Friday. Bye. Bye.